precious people of God, we are grateful to God for another edition of the Sunday class. Yes. Like we do say, there are some special editions of the Sunday class where we go in to our leadership summit to bring you succinct topics that we believe that it should not just be for the leaders that are gathered out there, you and I that are part of the Sunday class should yeah, also benefit from it. Yes. And today we talk about leadership in your home, but we are bringing you the section, the spiritual section of that leadership summit, which focused on the effective leadership of your home, God's recipe effective leadership of your home god's recipe so i would like you to join us even as we go into the leadership summit and bring you the highlights that we want you to also want it to bless you please come with us thank you thank you this morning this is a very very important topic i'm very close to the lord's heart and it has been quite a burden since uh, my husband has said this would be the topic for today. I believe that what we see in our world today indeed is a reflection of what we are as Christians and what our homes are like. It is not out of any uh, gain saying or cannot be underestimated why the Lord Jesus Christ says our lives is supposed to be the light of the world. If we see chaos around us and we see gun violence and we see disrespect and every other thing that discussant has listed as vices and some of us have suggested as vices, it's because our homes are not standing in the place of their position. The topic for this leadership meeting today is the leadership in the home, how it impacts the world around you. It's indeed a thing of concern that we have many Christians in the world today. We have many churches around the corner, but unfortunately, we tend not to see the impact of this presence in our communities and in our nation. That is why we are here today. And you are here today by divine appointment. You are here today because the Lord is counting on you to make a difference. You are here today because you matter. The topic for the spiritual aspect of this leadership summit meeting is effective leadership of your home, God's recipe. Now, before we go into the scriptures, there are some proven tips that I just quickly want to share with us. And some of them has been mentioned by our well-versed speaker. Personal leadership is key. We have talked about the man, as mentioned by our, our, our lead discussant, as being placed by God as a leadership. What if your own home doesn't have that man? Or, let us not quickly forget that there are homes without parents. The parents are gone. They've passed on. So it's just the children left. And they are still, <clears throat> you know, there must be a leader. So whosoever that leadership mantle falls upon in that home, it is necessary that each person will develop themselves as leaders. And whosoever that leadership mantle has been placed upon, that we respect and support that person. A good preacher preaches all the time without using words. I'll say that again. A good preacher preaches all the time without using words. Why? because actions speak louder than words. So also a good leader, whether it be in the home, 
in the office, in the community, or in the nation leads all the time. So everything that we do and say is a contribution towards a good leadership or a bad leadership in that environment. Leadership, as we have been told, can be at different levels, nation, community, or, or your home. Common to all this leadership is that leadership is not about what you left behind. It's about who you left behind. It's not about what you left behind. It's about who. It's not about the things that you do, the money that you have left behind. We have mentioned that it's good. But the real resource, the real focus, when I be in the home, the community, the nation, or the church, it's about who you have left behind. What are those people made up of? Are they fit to be leaders too in themselves? Leaders therefore develop the next generation while managers focus on positions and on their own authority. And much has been said about that. That is not the purpose of God to bring us into that position of leadership, especially our men. It's not to focus on the position and the authority that comes with the leadership. It's actually a great responsibility, as we have been told and we will see later. We should make ourselves increasingly unnecessary. A leader makes themselves increasingly unnecessary. What do I mean by that? Let your son or your daughter do what you would have done in your absence. Let them know exactly what to do. This is what dad would have done. And they would step into your shoes in your absence. You don't have to be dead. You may be out in another region or on tour or, or, or on assignment, professional assignment, career. But your daughter or your son, who you are leaving behind, should be able to step into your shoes and do exactly what you would have done. And what you would have done exemplifies what God would do. Amen. Let's quickly see. We say that the husband, according to the scripture, has been put in that position of leadership. Then, what should our men do? Should we leave our wives behind? Many husbands develop themselves but leave their wives behind. This is what I'm saying. Many husbands develop themselves, whether it be spiritually, professionally in their careers, or even emotionally, even in their hobbies, maybe writing and things like that. They develop themselves, but they leave their wives behind. The scripture quickly shows us some people that we could learn from. Adam is one. Lot and David are other people. For Adam, Adam could have shared more clearly with Eve what God had said about the tree of life. So my own husband, unlike Adam, takes his time to share scriptures with me that need clarity. If I read a scripture and I say, wow, this is a great scripture, but it could be seen this way or that way. What do you think? He takes that time to read, meditate on the same scripture and we sit down for clarity and deeper understanding. This is what should go on in the home. Adam could not have spoken up when Eve was getting it wrong. He didn't speak up, you see, but was still, he joined in doing what God had said not to do. And if we will bring this home to our lives today, it's still happening in some homes. The husband needs to speak up. You need to stand and say, this is not right. This is what the Lord would have us do. This is what the Lord has said. But rather to be quiet and quote unquote peace, joining what God does not have a hand in. Of course, that home is going to bear the consequence of it. And the light in that home that is supposed to shine to the world will dim. And how then would that home impact the world around them? What still, Abraham, uh, Adam did not just join in, he played the finger pointing game when there was a fallout. That shouldn't be our, our, our lot. Now let's go to Lot's wife. Lot's wife obviously did not know 
the God of Abraham, like Lot, her husband, did. I'm talking about as husbands, we should not leave our wives behind. Adam should have taught more of what God had said to him, to his wife, so that when she was tempted at that time, she would not have fallen. Lot's wife needed to have learned more about Abraham's God, so that at the time of fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah, she would know to trust God enough that God who provided whatever they had in Sodom and Gomorrah was able to do much more, and she would not have turned back and become a pillar of salt. And for David, if only Micah knew what David knew, that made him dance before the Lord with all his power and his might, she would not have despised him, and she would not have been cursed with barrenness by the Lord all the days of her life. So there are grave consequences to not taking on the great role of leadership in our homes. The other important point is that taking on the role of leadership in our homes qualifies us for the work of God. It's a qualifier for God's work. I haven't seen what happened with Eli, Samuel, and probably Moses, because we didn't hear of his own sons, you know, Paul says to his own spiritual sons, because he didn't have biological sons, so he took time to teach his own spiritual sons. He said most of what has been told to us in second, uh, um, I believe it's 1 Timothy 3, verses 3 to 5, like Ali discussed and said, and also the similar message to Titus in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. He told them what they should look out for in Choose, choosing elders, or what other translations may say, bishops, general overseers, or shepherds. These are leaders in spiritual events. But when we look at those scriptures, we find out that Paul painstakingly looked at the private lives of these people before they can be appointed into the leadership roles. And this is very important. He said, a man must be of unquestionable integrity, the husband of one wife, and their children must believe. Now, let's look at that. We talked about sex, and that is so important. Sex is so important in marriage. It's something that we should not gloss over. Let's look at what we just read in Titus chapter 1. Here, it says, men must be self-willed that is in some other translation, self-discipline. There's need for discipline, like my husband has said. It has been flouted and said, we say, okay, sex is like oxygen. It's needed. It is needed. Yes, it does help the nurturing of the man. But does that allow for uh, 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 a situation where there is no discipline? There's no discipline because I mean, it is needed. In fact, in the medical world, there are situations where you cannot take more than enough oxygen. If you take more than enough oxygen, it's going to blow out your lungs. But what the scripture is saying here, if we will look at it in the light of sex, it said you must be self-willed. You must not be quick-tempered. Don't be quick-tempered. Don't say, oh, because this is not happening. Oh, I will not do this or I will not do that. I'm going to show you in other ways of being passively aggressive towards you or even outrightly being aggressive towards you. He said, do not be addicted to wine. What is wine? Wine is leisure. Do not be addicted. There should be no addiction named in the body of Christ. Do not be violent. Some people go ahead to violently take what they believe is rightfully theirs, thereby doing untoward things that should not be mentioned amongst us. You should not be greedy. It's not all about you. Amen. And there are different ways of talking about it. Like my husband said, one of these seasons, we would really talk about sex. Maybe in the Sunday class school. So please look out for that. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 3 specifically, I want to bring something out there. Because I said earlier that Paul said almost the same thing verbatim to both Titus and Timothy, his sons. 
he taught them well. He said, not addicted to wine, in verse 3. Not a bully. Not a bully. In taking that oxygen that we need, uh, which we have used in as a synonym for sex, you must not be a bully. We must not be someone seen to be, I mean, saying this is my right, I need to take it, and thereby enforcing that right on that woman. We should not be quick-tempered, hot-headed, but, and this is where I'm going, but gentle and considerate. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Gentle and considerate. We will leave that for another time because that's not essentially our topic for today. But it's a great food for God. The glory of God is manifested in our homes as designed by God, not by following regular or secular rules and teachings, but by following the teachings of the Holy Spirit. This leads to the fascinating display of his light, that is God's light and glory to the world around us. Leading our homes is a God-given agenda. It's an agenda to imitate and display the relationship and the glory of the Trinity to the world. This is very important because God has set up the home the way he has set it up. And that is why we may, we need to follow with his own design plan. The husband, the wife, and the children, they represent the Trinity. It's to imitate and display the relationship between the Trinity and the glory that comes from this relationship to the world. It's also to display the relationship between Christ and his bride, which is the church, to the world. This is why we are called the visible display of God. So this is so important. And this topic is such and it's, it's so close to God's heart because it is the pivot on which it's the fulcrum on which we all stand and maintain balance to transmit the glory and the light of God to the world. By imitating the Godhead then, we should not look only to our own things. Each member of the Trinity always looked out for each other. The Father looked out for Jesus Many a times he would speak and say, one of which he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. One time when Jesus was praying, I was saying, I pray to you, Father, I say it loud just so that this ones may know what we have. What did he say? He said, I heard you, I already answered you. I mean, they were always there one for another. Jesus was there for the Holy Spirit too. He told the Pharisees at one time, he said, your sins against me may be forgiven. He said, but not that against the Holy Spirit, thereby giving honor unto the Holy Spirit. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit in turn always point to the will of the Father. Jesus himself said, not my will, but thine will be done. So you can see that unity and cohesiveness. A threefold cord cannot be easily broken. So if there's that unity between the father, the wife, and the children, that household stands forever. Whatsoever generational causes that has been placed on that household immediately is taken away. Amen. So let's look at Hosea 11, 1 to 9, and I'll just take excerpts from there. If we have done all these things that God has said then, you can say to yourself, oh, but I'm doing all this, I'm a Christian. Yes, I'm doing all that is being said. What could then go wrong? Hosea 11, 1 to 9, we'll pick an excerpt from there. It says, when Israel was only a child, I loved him. This is God speaking. I loved him. I called out my son and called him out of Egypt. But when others called him, he ran off and left me. He worshipped the popular sex gods. He played at religion with toy gods. And what is God saying there? He's saying, I have done the right thing as the parent, but my sons have, or my children, they have left me. 
I called out to them, but they would not answer. What did they go after? As soon as they got to the age whereby they could be influenced or, or they could see their peers, they went with what? They went with peer pressure. They ran off with their own friend's logic or the logic of the social media of the world. They left me, God said. And what did they do? They chose other gods by worshiping popularity. And these are the things we see in the world today. Popularity. This is what the peer pressure pulls the children into. Sex gods. These are things that are there in the social media for them to follow. They played at religion. That is, they no longer worship the true and only living God, but other things that they have paid attention to and focused on have become their gods. And we know what all these things are in the life of the younger generation today. But then, do we leave them to these vices? What did God do? Still in that passage, he said, still, I stuck with him. That is, I stuck with my sons. I led Ephraim. I rescued him from human bondage. So you might be on this forum today, or you might be listening today, and one or two or more of your children seem to have left you, like Israel left God and straight and went with, with peer pressure with the world. God said, I stuck with them. I rescued him from human bondage. We will not give up. You will not give up on that child. You will not give up. And how is this possible? God says, I never, he never acknowledged my help and never admitted it. Still talking about the nonchalance and the non-recognition of Israel to God. And this leads to consequences, of course, that like we know and have talked about. But what did God say? What was God's response to such children? How did it, did it uh, further expand on it? Let's see. He says, but how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I turn loose, Israel? How can I leave you to be ruined like Adma, like devastated Zeboam? I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insights churn in protests. And as we visualize this on a personal note, let's also visualize it, visualize it as us, as husbands, wives, and children, as being part of God's family. Are we turning away from God? Is, are we doing the things the way God would have expected? Are we studying these scriptures to see what God is challenging us to do? Or are we just reading books and following the saying of old prophets? whom when you look into their own homes, you don't see the results that God has said we should see. But God said, I will go after them. And how can we do that? We do that by standing in our prayer closet, watching to ensure prayerfully that these ones, these sons, these daughters, these spouse comes back to the place of glory that the Lord has set for them. Galatians chapter 5 was thoroughly read to us by our brother, but being the head is not about position or ego, but service to God. He will lose none, just as Christ will lose none of his sheep. It's a sacred responsibility. That is why we will not allow that son or that daughter, leave them to themselves, that they are grown. Let them go and do what they like with their lives. It's not about our talking. We win the wars on our knees. The father of the prodigal son stood always at the vantage position. That was why he could see him afar off when that son was approaching back to the house. What is that vantage position in our lives? We we'll know it in Habakkuk because he says it's the prayer tower. We would stand in prayer until that sheep returns and they will not be lost. Amen. He says, according to concerning the wife, we have talked about that. I'm not going to belabor that. Like I said, we are going to 
talk on sex one of these days at the Sunday class school. So please look out for that. But he says, be gentle and considerate. Amen. To the woman, submission to the husband is about obedience to the Lord as the church is supposed to submit to Christ. So if we will submit to Christ, we must submit to our husbands too. It may not be comfortable, but through it, we learn obedience and we seek after the grace to help in the time of need. The more grace you have, the, the more power you will have at your disposal to direct and determine the atmosphere in your home. So we seek grace from God to do those things that may not be that may not come easy. Jesus did the same. He sought grace, more grace. He was the fullness of grace himself so that he could submit to the will of the Father even when he said not my will but your will O God. Amen. Hebrews 11:35 tells us of women who brought their dead back to life. This is the power at the disposal of us as women. So everyone is a leader and a leader has a leader. So the responsibility of leadership is on the shoulder of all. But the leadership also that we stand in also is accountable to another leader. Even the man is accountable to Christ while we are accountable to God through our husbands in Christ Jesus. God's final resolution for the home, in conclusion, Hosea 14, 4 to 9. I will just speak excerpts from here to see what is God's final resolution. He says, I will heal their waywardness. I will love them lavishly. And whatsoever we hear God saying he will do to his body, the church today, is what we should do in response to our own homes, to our own families. I will heal their waywardness. I will love them lavishly. I will make a fresh start with Israel and he will burst into bloom. So give another chance where they may, may have failed or they, they have betrayed your trust. Give another chance. Forgive, like someone said earlier on. He will put down, he says, what God was speaking concerning the church, that the church will put down deep oak tree roots. So when we have influenced and impacted our household the way that we should they become oak trees amen they will put down deep roots the lord says and they will become splendid this is the amplified version of Hosea uh, chapter 14 and verses 4 to 9 so then when that is done we would impact our world around us according to that plan still in the same passage god speaking he said those who live near him, that is those who live near you, near your household, they will be blessed. The world around you, because you are living right, because we are doing things the way God has planned it out to be, they, the world around us will be blessed and they will prosper like golden grain. Everyone will be talking about them. Amen. Is that happening with your household today? Is that happening with my household today? Would they say, oh, that's a great couple. I love what I see. And I would like my family to be like theirs. Everyone will be talking about them. Spreading their fame as the vintage uncommon children of God. All this is found in scripture. I'm reading from Hosea 14, 4 to 9. God speaking, he said, I am like a luxuriant fruit tree. Everything you need is found in me. And that's the truth. It's not in those books that were written by other men. The, some books are inspired by God. Yes, be led to such books. Don't just read any book to guide in your marriage. He said, God says here in Hosea chapter 4, 14, he says, I am a luxuriant fruit tree. Everything you need is to be found in me. He goes on to say, if you want to live well, make sure you understand all of this. If you know what is good for you, you will learn this inside and out. God's path gets you where you want to go. 
right living people work them easily that is right living people righteous people people who work according to the steps and the dictates of the holy spirit in marriage they will work it easily the lord will make it easy for you to have a great home but those who wrong who do it by wrong living wrong living people they are always tripping and stumbling says the lord and this will not be our portion as said earlier this is a topic that is so important this is the reason why there's so much chaos around us because each home is not exactly shining that light that the lord will have us shine we need to go back to the drawing board to the master plan to the original theory the god's own theory god's own recipe for marriage he says it can be found in me in god amen thank you for watching that great session of our leadership session we believe that your home is unique under god's leadership and to address all the issues that have been challenging our world today it needs to start from our home yes my love you said a lot of things in that leadership uh, summit but now we want to pray for our great uh people who have also listened to what the lord shared through you would you love to pray for them yes amen father we thank you because you are god amen we thank you because indeed we are the visible display mm. of your glory and power yes lord. to the world around us mm. and that world begins from well inside ourselves yes and our homes mm. thank you father because you are the master hand that mm. is helping to coordinate yes, every areas of our lives Thank you because it comes out fully and gloriously, giving honor and praise to your name. Yes, Thank you, Father, because you are manifested to the world around us through the lives that we live in Christ Jesus. Yes, so it is, and so it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, it's been a privilege to empower you to, to fulfill. fulfill your God-given God destiny. destiny. Amen. Amen.